one is placed in devotional service. And this service dispels all one's misgivings about Krishna or God, and Krishna's activities, form, pastimes, name, and other features. After these misgivings have been perfectly cleared away, one becomes fixed in one's study. Then one relishes the study of Bhagavad Gita and attains the state of feeling always Krishna conscious. In the advanced stage, one falls completely in love with Krishna. This highest perfectional stage of life enables the devotee to be transferred in Krishna's abode to the spiritual sky, Goloka Vrindavan, where the devotee becomes eternally happy. A person who accepts the path of devotional service is not bereft of the results derived from studying the Vedas, performing austere sacrifices, giving charity, or pursuing philosophical and fruitive activities. Simply by performing devotional service, he attains all these, and at the end he reaches the supreme eternal abode. Get in your phone, stick it in your ear, and keep it there. And I'm sorry, that's great, but you would just be without having to ask. So this is the last verse in the eighth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. And that's Prabhupada was mentioning in the book for us. The 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th chapters, these six, are the essence, essential features of our Lord Jesus. And the other chapters are like coverings. Not coverings in the sense of ignorance, but coverings in the sense of uh, covers of a book book may be very nice, but without a cover, it is not complete. So, the book, Bhagavad Gita, is complete in 18 chapters. But, within these 18 chapters, these six, bring one to the point of constant and determined meditation upon the Supreme Personality of God and Lord Jesus Christ. In the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna finished off his discussion by comparing the yogi who engages in the mechanical system of yoga and that yogi who's always meditating on him, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God. And these two are seen to be different so long as that yogi engaged in the mechanical system does not come to the point of meditating on the Supreme Personality of God. In other words, when one actually meditates on Krishna, then he's got himself fixed in yoga. Now, of course, Krishna does not speak in chapters when he's talking to Arjuna. And the first verse of the seventh chapter is where Krishna is explaining, uh, after he says this, Yogi Nama Kisara Shamakitanta Shadavamrasa Deomam Sami Yukatamamakha about this yogi who is worshipping him with great and transcendental faith. The next verse, the very next verse, he says uh, that one should try to always fix his mind on the Supreme Personality of God. The mind must always be fixed on Krishna. And by fixing the mind on Krishna, one can come to the point of Ashamshayam Samagrama. Understanding Krishna in full without any more doubt, understanding him completely, at least that he is the Saman Bonam, that Saman Bonam means 
absolute truth. He is that which is to be achieved by all yogic practices, by all austerities and penances, and especially through the process of transcendental meditation on the lotus feet. Now, one may be asking, why is it so that simply thinking about Krishna is so good that it will be uh, so good as all austerities, penances, in fact, more. Therefore, it is stated in this verse that it is so, because formerly Krishna was just implying it, but now Krishna is saying it directly. It is so. Can you make this better? <coughs> it is so that Vedeshu, Yogyeshu, Tapaksu, Chaitam, Dhanayeshu, Vipunya Phalam, Pradishtam, Ajayati Tatsarvam. First, Krishna mentions all of the different paths of advancement. Vedeshu, one may be studying the Vedic literatures. Study is going on. And by studying the Vedas, one may be able to understand the absolute truth. Touch Chadanamuna Yo, Gyanavaragi Yukeda, Vashanti Atani, Chadanam, Bhakta Shruta Vidi, that devotee who is studying the Vedic literatures carefully, undergoing the process of austerities, penances, acting for Krishna, but so engaged, he will understand the absolute truth by such study of the Shastra. So therefore, one may be thinking, if I am not studying the Shastra, how I will understand Krishna? But they they do. Ajayati tatsarvam. Ajayati means you surpass all of these things. You surpass the study of the Vedas. Because after all, the study of the Vedas culminates in devotional service for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So if one is already situated there, he is said to be surpassing the Vedic religion. In the sense of he does not require the Vedic knowledge in order to be advanced. That does not mean he gives up the Vedas. He reads, he understands the Vedic literatures, but he's already on a platform beyond the ritualistic portions. Karma Kanda or even Jnana Kanda. He is situated in a very high platform. Yogeshu, in the processes of yoga or sacrifice. The Veda, mainly, yogis are uh, recommended. Performances of sacrifices or elevation to the heavenly planets. However, Krishna said that a jayati, one passes that as well, surpasses even that platform since he is engaged in devotional service. Then, Tabaksu, you do not have to go to the Himalayan mountains meditating for long periods of time in great austerity. Because just by performance of devotional service, one surpasses all austerities as well that one may perform. And Ganeshu, one to speak of these things, just even what charity with that. Giving in charity and putting karma, doing pious works. These things are not at all value. They have no value compared to devotional service. Now, that brings us to a point which is often misunderstood. That one considers that he can give up study of the Veda, sacrifice, austerity, penance, pious activity, and just engage in devotional service. But we cannot understand what is devotional service unless it includes the study of the Vedas, charity, penance. After all, these things are part and parcel of the devotional process. They are not independent. If you are performing devotional service, you will attain all these processes. In other words, you will be able to get knowledge very easily. 
how is this understood? Not very difficult. You can study the Vedas all day, all night, for years and centuries. But if you are devoid of devotion, the Vedas will remain a mystery. Because it is the devotion itself which brings one to the point of understanding the purport of the Vedas. One who is devoted to spiritual master and Krishna. That means devotion. To him, all of the purports of the Vedas are revealed. So, we find that you can study Veda, but without devotion. It is so much dry knowledge. After all, the Mayavadis study the Vedas all the time. The Mayavadis are studying Vedic knowledge constantly. At least formerly the Mayavadis did study. Nowadays, the present day Mayavadis know nothing, even about their Mayavad philosophy. They cannot cause it, if they do, it is generally all mixed up. Formerly the Mayavadis were much more devoted to Vedic study alone. That's all they would do. They would not perform any uh, activity of acting. They were not doing any action in devotion. They were simply sitting in one place and studying data. That's all. But that's not sufficient because you can't understand it that way. You can't understand Krishna. He's the source of the goal of all Vedas. I am to be known by all the Vedas. Vedas it may be difficult, very rare, for a Vedic scholar to ever understand Krishna. But my devotee, he can easily understand. <coughs> Therefore, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Bhaktyama By Bhakti, you can know. By Bhakti, I am to be understood. Devotion. <coughs> Krishna never says, karma mama vijanati, dhyana mama vijanati, yoga mama vijanati, dhana yama, dhana mama vijanati, or yagya mama vijanati, tapasya mama vijanati. He says, back to mama vijanati. And that's all he says. So I want you not speculate. And he goes so far as to say that I'm understood by devotion, but devotional service is so great, it brings causeless knowledge, it brings detachment. Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayoti Daha, Denayat Yashya Bhairagya Gyanam Jaya Mahayam You can't understand Krishna. Yes, it is possible. Uh, even if one may not be very renounced or knowledgeable in general, because it will come, knowledge, renunciation will come upon one causelessly if he simply engaged in devotional service to the Supreme Personality of God. Causeless knowledge and detachment, that means even though we may not be qualified by all Vedic procedures, we may not be qualified to take up renunciation, but still, because we are engaged in devotional service, causeless knowledge and detachment develop as a matter of course. Of course, that course may take longer in some, and shorter in others, depending on the dedication in that service to Lord Vasudeva Krishna. In other words, it is not that if you simply do some devotional service and immediately you surpass all Vedic scholars and activities. Sometimes we find like that neophyte devotee. They go to India and you may see some persons are engaged in fruitive activities to make money, as most people have to in this world. And then, being that he does not understand things very well, he considers himself superior in various ways and parades around as a great sadhu. But just because one has done a little devotional service, please somebody take care of that child. Just come sing us to be served. Do all the sports. 
So, when they think, yes, I'm better, I'm superior to all of these fruits of works, but then that same person may not survive in devotional service because of being neophyte and being puffed up. And then he drops off again, back to his malachic existence. So what is the meaning of that superiority? This means cheating business. That one should not try to proclaim himself very great because he has done devotional service. But rather one should try to serve with love and devotion. Humbly. Even though it is definitely so, one may gain knowledge by devotional service. And if one studies, his knowledge becomes amplified very much. Knowledge may come, yes, automatically, but if you study, how much more knowledge? And that becomes amplified like anything by studying within the process of devotion. Those who study within the process of devotion become extraordinarily Learn it. Those who perform austerities within the process of devotion become very qualified and advanced. Those who give charity within the process of devotion become very much exalted. Each and every one of these processes performed within the process of devotion becomes very much more elevated. How within the process of devotion just make a one? Very simple. Bhakti yoga is very broad. Many activities are there. So within Bhakti yoga, we study Bhagavad Gita, Shrimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Nectar of Devotion, Teaching of Lord Chaitanya, Nectar of Instruction, etc. Krishna books, there are many books which we read. And we study them in classes. And therefore, as the basis of the process, hearing is established. Shravanadi should be just a koryo udoi, pure, pure knowledge, expand. Pure knowledge expands as a product of the devotional hearing. Shravanadi, by hearing, one's knowledge develops, that real knowledge of what he is. How is austerity performed? For well, like our most important activity and mission is the Sankirtan mission. Sankirtan yoga. The Sankirtan mission is for those who are wanting to take up austerity. It is not for the weak in heart. It is for those who have some desire to perform a little austerity, tapasya. Because one is doing many things at once with Thank You Tan Also, he's performing Dan, giving in charity. And he's also accepting charity. He's performing many activities at once. He's giving in charity the greatest gift. He's transcendental literatures. And he's accepting in charity whatever the conditioned souls might want to deliver. And it's an austerity from many points of view. First of all, it's not easy to do it. You have to try and endeavor, struggle a little. If it's hot out, too cold out, too hot out, too wet out. And carrying the book bag may make a little burden on the shoulders, the feet may be burdened. It's a burden. But the devotee accepts that austerity for the sake of satisfying the Supreme Personality of God in above all satisfying Srila Prabhupada and the whole civil of succession by transcendentally distributing these books everywhere, anywhere, as much as possible. That is austerity. Within the process of Bhakti Yoga, that is the topmost austerity. We also have other austerity of going and distributing Krishanam. Uh, sometimes they don't want just going on a chanting party, that's austerity. Sometimes people think it's very funny. If you get tired or something, get chased by the police. Austerity to follow these four ideas of principle. Seems like nowadays this is the biggest austerity on the planet. 
simple principles. Who can perform the handful of people? Even those who are taking up the position of learned personalities from very high time falling before I go to the principles. <coughs> right? Because it's austerity. They don't even understand why they should. They don't even see any good in it. Yeah. What to speak about medical groups, we can get thousands of medical groups from following all the regular groups. But anyway, people will do what they wish to do because of their attachment. But the devotee is working on the platform of austerity. Meaning, he struggles. Even if it's a difficulty, he does it anyway. For the satisfaction of Krishna. For the satisfaction of spiritual master. And that person becomes very exalted. He becomes exalted by the austerity. Normally, people would have accepted austerity for the sake of becoming exalted in the sense of having uh, mystic powers. By the power of austerity, one could curse others, or one could elevate through the heavenly planets. Same with charity. Charity makes one exalted. And by giving away much charity, he receives so much in the future. He receives so much and uh, can go up to the heavenly planets. And by learning, great knowledge and learning, he may also elevate. By great renunciation, he may even go up to the planet of the eternal brahmacharyas in the Kapalo planet. Or he may even attain the planet of Lord Brahma itself, such a book. By many pious results altogether. But one who's performing devotional service attains all those results, and in the end, reaches the Supreme Court. Ajay Tita Tsarvami Dhamma Dhamma Yogi Parashtana Upayiti Chakya. In the end, he achieves that supreme original abode, Krishna. Although by study, maybe by Vedic study, you might be able to attain from the Tattva, from the Jyoti. But to go beyond that, where the form of the Lord is situated, one must have devotion. By austerity, charity, penances, sacrifices, one can go to the heavenly realms, or higher, within the universe. But, even if there were processes available today for going to, by the locus or higher, by charity, austerity, penance, meditative process, temple worship, etc., still, at this point, devotional service is much easier. Therefore, why take up a more difficult process when the easier process is available? But it is not possible in this age to accept austerity, charity, penance, sacrifice outside of the process of devotional service and actually attain the goal of going back home back to God. It's not possible because the people of this age are very fallen. Kalea, Doshi, Dosha, Di, Rajan, Yesdiego Mahatma. This age of Kali is like a Doshan Eat. An ocean of faults. And within this ocean of faults, you will find so many lackings. Prayanal, Paishak, Pumsa, Kalos, Menjigejana, Manda, Samanda, Mandayo, Manda, Bhagya, Pavish. Prayanal, Paishak, Pumsa, Kalos, Menjigejana, the duration of life, the bodily situation is reduced, very much reduced. And the intelligence is very much reduced. Being the duration of life is reduced, one cannot meditate for long extended periods of time as formerly was possible uh, during the Satya Yuga, when man meditated for tens of thousands of years, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 years, because the duration of life was 100,000. So, Formerly also, great intelligence was there. Man could perform great sacrifices, austerities. Just like that famous example of Vashishtamuni taking the vow of forgiveness 
And even though Vishamicha out of envious, out of enviousness, because Vashishtha would not give up his cow, the Kanduk, Vishamicha killed the sons of Vishishtha Muni one after another. And Vishishtha was very much distraught by this. But although he had the mystic power to destroy the whole army of Vishamicha, and Vishamicha himself, he took a vow of forgiveness and did not do it. The vow of forgiveness prevented him from doing it, although he wanted to kill himself, which he could not succeed, trying to jump off of a mountain. He ended up in a foam-type cushion, which wasn't there before. Trying to drown himself in the river, the river just pushed him up to the top again. could not do it. Any, any method he took, to kill himself would not work. He was in so much distress at this, having to just simply see Vishwami to kill his whole family. But still, he accepted that vow of forgiveness and never spoke angrily against Vishwami. And who's going to do that today? Such vow means such intelligence to see things equally. Salapsarveshogurteshu. It's easy to see all living entities equally when there's no problem. But when someone's envious upon you, to see them equally is very difficult. Therefore, in this age, Kali Yuga, that intelligence being not there, therefore the process must be something which does not demand the impossible. Similarly, grand temple worship, the Dwarpa Yuga, required a grand temple. And nowadays, to find that grand temple and to find it being fully engaged in Krishna's service with the proper form of worship, all golden plates and jewels and other things, the Muslims helped to destroy that by destroying as many temples as they could, stealing away all of the opulence and the jewels and everything else. And then when they didn't get, the British came and helped to finish off the rest. Kali Yuga is not really the time. But still, one may, because we are very close to the Dwarpa Yuga. We are still within the Yuga Sandhya, almost. So that one may also establish great temple worship. The overlapping of the Yugas, but the mixture is still there. To a certain degree. So, we find that in this age, worship of the Lord is very much dependent on chanting of the holy name. But still, Jiva Goswami, the actual grandest scholar and propounder of the Vaishnava literatures, recommended that one must worship the deity in the temple alongside with chanting the holy name of the Lord. The Bhagavatamar and Bhagavatamar means Bhagavatam Didi means the following the footsteps of Bhagavat, the great souls, Mahatmas, who are engaged in bringing Krishna consciousness from door to door, town to town, village to village. But simultaneously with that, the Pandarajaki Vidhi must be accepted. The rules and regulations, methodology and procedures, for worshipping the deity and other procedures for one's own personal achar, is called. Means um, regulative principle. Therefore, we do both. We follow we follow the principles of the uh, regulated devotional life and we are engaged in simply the preaching mission because in the highest level one goes preaching may not have to follow very many principles like that. You may simply be going out preaching, distributing Krishna consciousness and for him he's already on the highest platform. The Bhagavatam Vidhi may be engaged in hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, distributing Srimad Bhagavatam and following the orders of the Mahabhagavata spiritual master who is giving him the mission. So the Prabhupada has given us all the mission to distribute his books 
He said, back to the, this is the real mission. And all other missions are secondary. This is the real mission. This one mission alone is sufficient to spread Krishna consciousness throughout the whole world. Therefore, we have been pushing on this book distribution. But of course, some don't tolerate that and don't like it. Therefore, we cannot push so hard. But the fact is, this is the mission. The Bhagavad to be. Everything else falls more or less, more and more, anyway, into the category of the Pancharachi. Which is also good, because if you don't follow both simultaneously, then one forgets about Krishna somehow. He forgets some principles of cleanliness. Uh, he forgets some regulation. And he can fall down. It is not necessarily that it must happen, but it might happen. Therefore, Jiva Goswami said, one must engage in both processes simultaneously. Distribution of literature to our engagement in the Sankatan mission, Bhagavad Gita, and performing grand temple worship, engaging in studies and austerities, charity penances, simultaneously. Both these procedures must be done. If one just sticks to one without the other, he loses his life, practically speaking. That does not mean, of course, that now all of our Pajaris should now give up everything and run out the door and distribute some books. No. It means that some will distribute the books and some will worship the deity. And both will be engaged in the Sankitan mission. That is why society is so important. In one's individual life, it would be very difficult if everybody had to have his deity or Shalagam Shiva and distribute the books and do everything else. If everybody was doing everything, it would be very inefficient. Therefore, Bhakti Vinod Thakur recommended we have a society whereupon some people do one part of the mission and other people do another part of the mission. And all together, it's a big mission which accomplishes the purpose of the preaching. It's a preaching mission which includes the portion of the worship, the portion of the scholarship, the portion of the maintenance. And it just pushes forward this book distribution mission with all instead of sincerity and enthusiasm and determination. So, we find that this program is perfect in all respects because it includes all of the Vedic prescriptions. The Veda, study of the Vedas, Yagyas, Tapasya, Dhanam, Charity, so many. Vedic study may be there, yoga, sacrifices, tapasyas, austerities, dana, charities, and more. The good karmic activities, pious activities. All of these things are included within the process of bhakti. As Krishna himself says. Therefore, one should never think that by surrendering to Krishna, he's going to be the loser in some way. You do not fear. I will free you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. But what greater guarantee does one want than that? Krishna says, Saradharma Pramitya. You give up all these other things. And he's including everything. Because he uses the word Saradharma. Mam e kam sharam brada. And if you didn't understand the first line, there's the second. Mam e kam. Krishna says me. But he doesn't just say me, he says mam e kam. Me alone. Me singularly. Sharanam brada. You take shelter of me. Not the demigods. Not in some other personality, not in your pious activities, not in the heavenly planets, not even in Brahmaloka, not anywhere, not even in Brahman. Mam e kam in Krishna, alone. You take shot. This is not just some philosophical point. This is Krishna's conclusion. This verse, Bhagavad Gita, is well known as the conclusion. It is the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita. Sarva Dharma Purinjaja. My dear Arjuna, you didn't want to fight, I'm saying to you now, 
Give up all other previous conceptions, all other previous activities, which you may call occupational duties, you may call religious duties. You may think they are what they are, but I'm telling you, put it to you, give them all up. And mommy comes shining up the door just to render to me alone. Don't worry, thinking, oh, if I don't perform these processes, then what shelter I will have, what protection. Aham, Twam, Sarvapapa, I'll protect you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. So what greater guarantee can we want? What more perfection of life would be there? If one just does what the Supreme Personality of God had said. If one just depends on Krishna. What more can you want? Because he's saying, I protect you. I protect you from all these things that you're worried about, therefore you're running about, or giving up the battle, or making up a battle, or making money somewhere, somebody, or somebody's trying to become famous, or somebody's trying to protect himself, or whatever. So I take care of all these things. Yogic shame of Ahamyaham. I carry what you lack. I preserve what you have. It's the sense. You don't have to worry for these material things. And you don't even have to worry for anything, even so called spiritual things. And natural spiritual things, because surrendering to Krishna is the real spiritual. Coming to the point of totally depending on the Supreme Personality of Godhead and surrendering unto Him in every way is, in fact, the perfection of life. Krishna recommended the Srimad Bhagavatam, which takes up the instruction after Bhagavad Gita, demonstrates this by coming to the culmination of Bhagavatam, which is the tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, wherein it is clearly seen how the devotee of the Supreme Lord must engage himself in the transcendental loving personal service of the Supreme Lord himself. So that is the culmination. The greatest goal, the greatest achievement to come to the point of serving Krishna in love and devotion. And that is what we are trying to do together in this Krishna consciousness movement. By distributing this transcendental Krishna consciousness, we come to that point of understanding the Supreme Lord. We come to the point of developing our pure love. And this, after all, is the goal. To just serve Krishna with all our energy and enthusiasm. And we'll get to that point of loving Him. There's no doubt. You just have to be a little sincere. A little sincere. Following the four regular principles, chanting 16 rounds a day means you're a little sincere. And then, fully engaging oneself in the devotional service of the Lord, with all desire, makes one really sincere. Accepting austerity, if sometimes it's difficult anyway, do it in out of love for Krishna. These, this kind of an understanding of loving devotion for the Supreme is what will get us back to God, without a doubt. So don't neglect this. Don't become neglectful. Maybe in one's old age you become neglectful, thinking that nah, I don't have to perform all these austerity penances. Struggle may not be necessary. It is necessary. For indeed, Penance and austerity purify even the great souls. Krishna says this about you. One should never give these things. One should always be engaging, pushing on this Krishna consciousness movement with all one's enthusiasm. There is nothing else to do for the sincere soul. God, any questions? Quite to this point. Not even slightly deviating from this point. Of this verse. <clears throat> we do it anyway. It may be 
it's certainly difficult for you if you have a desire, but if you do it anyway, then gradually you'll become purified. So when you become purified, the next step is you desire, like anything, to help others. You see that unless you distribute these literatures, there's no hope for this world, frankly speaking. People are going more and more insane by the day. Although it's a very special kind of insane. It's not raving insane. It's, it's just there, insanity. But the whole world is becoming insane equally. They're all degrading equally different. They can't really see that they're going insane. Of course, somebody here may be insulted that I say the world is insane. Don't worry, classes to come will probably talk about how they're insane. Just take our word for it. You haven't already seen it. In any case, the only hope is to distribute these books of Silva. That is our conviction. That was Prabhupada's conviction. So we think we can quite honestly and frankly, without any difficulty, say that. Now, when you understand that too, then you'll have no problem giving out these literatures. Even if you don't think you want to help people, you can just think you want to help the world. It takes a lot of personalism to want to help people. You can even, even if you're just not so personal, if you want to help the world, that's better for those more personally minded fellows. They can just want to help the world. That's okay, because that includes the people too. And then you can go out and just do folks that way. But somehow or another, just do it. And purification will take place, there's no doubt. And then you will want. You will want to help people. Just like we find sometimes devotees who don't go preaching ever, and they're in the temple only, that if even a guest comes, walks in the door, they run like any. They pretend they never saw him. <laughs> No, they just glance like this is the eye quick. Then if the guest happens to go like this, they go. <laughs> but that same person, if he goes out and preaches, Krishna conscious, the taste comes. And then he understands, yeah, the whole point of my preaching is to bring people to the temple. If I bring people to the temple, those devotees who don't go out preaching stay in the temple, or they run away. <laughs> kind of insane, you know. So all these things must work together. So it all comes by trying. The more you try to preach, the more you succeed in preaching, the more you get the taste of preaching and everything goes away. Prabhupada mentions in one favor that those who go in the church or in the moshi, they all do kanishtanik after. So for them it is possible to come to higher. The what? Moshi? Moshi? Ah, Moshi question, yes. All time check, you know, you were talking about. Oh, it mentioned that the, these people are also, some of them, kind of shadikai. So this shadikai means one who. It's not so easy just to be, it's not so easy to be a shadikai, by the way. It's not like you're, you're, you're born a kind of shadikai. It's not so easy to be a kind of shadikai, especially now in this modern time. Kinestati Khan means, oh, another word is Prakritabhaka. It is stated that he worships the Supreme Lord in the temple and spiritual master, maybe. He's worshiping a deity in the temple. But he doesn't have the faintest idea about relating to other devotees or saintly personalities. That person's a Kinestati Khan. Some people, they go to the church and they don't even worship. They don't even see the Lord being in the church. Some people don't have any idea how to worship you. They may go because it was their family tradition. They may go because somebody told them they have to. They may go because they're afraid of being poor. They're not even worshiping the Lord in the temple or in the church. Kind of like a negative prevention. They may not even be on the level of Kanishtadi Like one of them sees God in the temple or the church or wherever. 
And that's all he sees. He doesn't see God anywhere else. Then he may come to the category of things that. Of course he can advance. Why can't he advance? Everybody can advance. We advance. <clears throat> Who joined this movement as much as I do? <laughs> any much money cards to my how many Uru money cards to my Everybody joins on the lowest level. Everybody's born on the lowest level. Klaus Sambhava. Everybody in the Kali Yuga takes his birth in the Sutra level. And by purification process, we may advance. Nowadays, who's gone through the Garbhadana Samskaras? Whose parents went through the Garbhadana Samskaras? And the other Samskaras, or factual initiation is around. <coughs> I mean, who follows these things? And even if somebody follows these things, are they actually Brahmins to begin with, purified? Therefore, in the Shastra, it says, Hello, Shukra You don't have to bother very much with all kinds of classification problems. One class. But you can become advanced by proper purification. You can come to the platform of any other class in Varnas. Even the Brahman, not very difficult. But one must be properly chained. But in general, everybody is on a very low level. Devotees come, all the devotees want devotees to come. If all the devotees want devotees to come, then the devotees come, fulfilling the desires of the devotees. And if you want all the devotees, if you want devotees to come, that means when somebody walks out the door, you don't tuck your head in your bee bag and run down front of you. Just say welcome. Which is what we say to our guests. Welcome. Yes. Uh, when we meet somebody on the street who has spoken, read some books of Shiva, most of them find it very difficult to, to understand it. This is because they don't have the devotion. Well, they don't. They find it difficult to understand anything about spiritual life because they don't even understand it on the body. When you speak of devotion, they don't understand the simplest thing. Therefore, they should just be encouraged to go on reading the books and gradually they will understand. Prabhupada wrote it in such a way that every one of his books is understandable by anybody. But he has to read it. Immediately you're not going to understand it. I mean, just look, if you just pick up this Bhagavad Gita verse, a person who accepts the path of devotional service <laughs> is not bereft of the results derived from studying the Vedas. <laughs> Performing austere sacrifices, <laughs> giving charity, ah, to the Red Cross, <laughs> or pursuing philosophical, philosophical, yes, I remember, Greek philosophers, <laughs> or fruitive activities. Fruitive? <laughs> Pear jelly, apple jelly. <laughs> <laughs> a brand new person, he can't, he can't understand anything. He has to be initiated gradually into the process of understanding our vocabulary. Anybody in this room knew what a fruitive activity was before he came to Krishna Gandhi? I remember it took me some months before I realized it had nothing to do with fruit. <laughs> Because nobody explained it to me. Because they never actually explain. A fruit of activity means you get some result from something you do. And that's called a fruit. Just like a fruit grows on a tree. And that's the result of the tree's, you know, the tree's life, consciousness, austerity, whatever a tree does. So the fruit is a result of the tree's thing. 
So when you make an activity, that's involved a fruit of activity. Because you have received a fruit, a result. Because the word is simply not used that way in America, practically. I mean, nobody ever speaks of fruits of results or fruits of activities. <laughs> Maybe in some Christian thing, it's the reaping of the fruits of your actions. Maybe, I'm not even sure. But I've never heard of it. So it takes a while, it's very difficult. I mean, I remember my case. Also, my eyes are not the greatest, so that's a little excuse. But I always would go to the back of the kirtan because I was afraid to stick my nose in the front of the <laughs> And I always noticed that everybody was kind of facing forward, but I never really knew what we were facing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just some nice flower arrangement. <laughs> there were a lot of nice colors. <laughs> and it wasn't until one day, like one week later, that all of a sudden I noticed there were there were there was something on the altar. Because <laughs> I had to wash the floor, you know. And the curtains were open. So I I, I came in with the bug in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was pleasantly surprised and I went and I asked what are those things on the altar they said what things I said well these are statues and they kind of looked at me like I was totally nuts <laughs> all I saw was colors you know <laughs> so Brand new people who have just absolutely no idea about anything <laughs> have to be very, very carefully brought into the understanding of things in general. It's like you tell somebody, come on, we'll take Mushana. <laughs> <laughs> now, what might go through that person? <laughs> we'll take Mushana. <laughs> Is that a person that we pick up? <laughs> Is that a thing you pick up and take somewhere? Does everybody pick it up and take it? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> then they bring you to eat something. <laughs> and then it's, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's food. <laughs> and they go, no, 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 this is not food. This is food. <laughs> So one has to be very, very careful how he breaks a newcomer into all of these different things in Krishna consciousness. One should never assume that anybody knows anything as far as a newcomer goes. Even you say to somebody, come on, don't be so attached. <laughs> you may be wondering, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Every little thing we say has to be explained. So therefore, what can we do? They just have to read these books and gradually by reading they catch on. Just like everybody, every translator that ever came to translate public books asked, what does the Supreme Personality of Godhead mean? And I say, it doesn't mean anything in English either. It is brand new expression, simply created out of the necessity to explain Bhagavan Sri Krishna. So, Supreme Personality of Godhead, or whatever else you say in all these different languages, is a new expression. People just got to learn it. Just like also, in some most languages, they don't have the word devotee. Because actually, devotee comes from French in English. It's not an English word, it's a French word. And the only reason in, in, the, in English it's used was because there were some devotees of various material subject matters. 
and the word became popular because it's a French word, but in almost all the other languages, these things are, are difficult to come up with. I think German is another language which has a word, word. the Gewalt is a good word. Yeah, anyway, close enough. But the but in other languages there's no such words. So I say use the word bhakta. Of course a lot of them don't like the word bhakta translate. He's telling us some of the problems with those the translation. They say, but nobody knows what this word means. I say, yes, but nobody knows what any of these words mean. They have to learn in the context. Nobody knows what any of these words mean. Even you say God, nobody knows what it means. And that's just a word in every, everybody's language. Everybody has the word God, but nobody knows what it means, isn't it? Even, I remember we once, I mentioned this before, the Archbishop of Hyderabad, we asked him, what do you mean by God? Because we want to start a philosophical conversation. He said, well, there are so many interpretations nowadays as to what the word God means. So many different ideas. I'm not sure. So, some of them, they don't even know what God means now. They're not sure. I remember once I had a rousing argument with one of my uncles, who happens to be in charge of Mother Teresa's mission. So, he immediately couldn't stand me as a devotee. So then I, you know, to defend Krishna consciousness, I said, well, what do you think is God? And their main the main understanding of God is He's just everywhere. He's everything. In other words, they're my bodies. It's all one. Therefore, even the word God nobody understands, and they have to learn it in the context of Krishna consciousness literature. Self they don't understand. These are not even Sanskrit words. What is the self? Ask anybody, what is your self? We do it all the time in the chanting parties. When the big roaring kirtan stops, somebody walks out of the party and says, Now, we're going to make an experiment with all of you. You know, as soon as you do it immediately, as soon as the chanting stops, you don't even say hello, how are you, and then it just boom. Now, we're going to make an experiment with you. We want all of you out there to point to yourself And that leaves them generally completely bewildered. Because <laughs> when they were listening to the kirtan, some of them might have been thinking, oh, this is some kind of really wild, strange stuff. These people must be completely crazy, right? <laughs> then one of these so-called crazies steps out of the crowd and says, now, we're going to make an experiment with you. <laughs> Point to yourself. Point to yourself. Self? <laughs> So then some brave souls in the audience, they go, No, 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 that's your chest. No, 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 that's your skull. Then some, they go, That's your body. It's not you. And then you start a whole philosophical discussion with the audience like this. So, it's very interesting. People, they don't know even the simplest definition. What is myself? What is God? What's the speed of the universe? We're still finding out that one. So, we should not worry that people may not be able to understand everything right now. Because they can't understand anything right now. Therefore, you have to start somewhere. If you're going to understand something, you've got to start somewhere. And Prabhupada has written these books in such a wonderful way that you can start anywhere. And that's the right place to start. It may take you a little bit to understand, begin to understand what's going on. But there is quite nice glossaries in the back of each of our books. And if, they, if they're told about the glossary, it might be very interesting. Intelligent persons, they first read the table of contents. Unintelligent persons, they start from the back of the book and look forward. <laughs> they read newspapers like that, too. But of course, if they do that, then they'll have the glasses. So that's good, too. <laughs> that answer this.
When you're just walking down the street, when you're in a kirtan mood, we don't recommend you just start chanting loudly. That's going to look very strange. I don't think people will understand it at all. So you don't have to worry. You can chant to yourself, sure. But you shouldn't chant loudly then. Just, just picture, okay? You just pretend you're a karmi walking down the street. And then you're just, you know, thinking about sense gratification you're going to have. And how you're very much you're conscious and aware of how you look, your appearance, so that other people on the street think you're cool and neat and proper and first class. <laughs> and you're watching everybody else too. They're watching you, watching them, watching them, and watching you. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, there's this person who's always dressed a little bit very strange. <laughs> Sometimes two different colors. <laughs> of course, nowadays that's common. And then his mouth is going. <laughs> Real hard. <laughs> and he's carrying an arm full of books. And then he sees you. <laughs> and you see him seeing you. <laughs> and then you wonder. <laughs> and then he approaches you and gives you one of those books. <laughs> You have to have some mercy on it. You have to try and look like somewhat near the realm of normal. <laughs> Smiling nicely. What do you think, Rogini? <laughs> You can't be a fanatic all the time. You to try and present yourself as. <laughs> Devotees are different, there's no doubt about it. They're different, that's all there is to it. There's no way we can act like normal people. No way. It's not possible. <laughs> in America, in the big bus terminal, the Port Authority says 40 seconds to eat. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's impossible for a devotee to sneak around there distributing books. They generally give us permission, but sometimes not. So, actually what happens, they give permission for two, and we usually put four in there. <laughs> two. So, <laughs> the police have instructions how to find the devotees. <laughs> And they're told, it's no problem whatsoever. You just go to the persons with the bright, shining faces. <laughs> There'll be nobody else with a bright, shining face. <laughs> Smiling. Everybody else will be dull and gray, looking down at the ground and running real fast. <laughs> and the devotee will have a bright, shining, smiling face. And will not be in a hurry to go anywhere. <laughs> and without fail, they find the devotees. So one day we asked them, the police, because they're friends in New York. New York police are the friendliest of all world. So we asked them, we said, how did you find us? <clears throat> they said, oh, we just go for the ones with the bright, shining faces. <laughs> so you just, there's no way you can look like a normal materialist. It's not going to work. Doesn't happen. But one should try to present himself in a way which does not completely boggle the mind of the person he's trying to deal with. In other words, you have to fit somewhat within his narrow scheme of things. For him, he thinks people should be from here to here. Devotees are from there to there. So we have, so we have to kind of narrow down our way of appearing 
to become acceptable to his preconceived notion of what a person should be. And then from that point we'll expand his consciousness. But in the beginning you must you must respect the position that he is at. Let not the wise disrupt the minds of the ignorant who are engaged in fruitive works, but they should be encouraged to act in works of devotion. That applies also to the way you present yourself on saying the time or on preaching. It's bad enough when you have to go on the street chanting like Krishna wearing what they call the bed sheets. But if you do it with two different color socks, <laughs> that makes it even harder. <laughs> All the brahmacharis and all men should tie up their sikha. Sikha is supposed to be tied in a certain knot in the back. Not that the Sikha is in 35 directions. <laughs> <laughs> Clothes should always be neat and clean, as much as possible. The body should look decent. Not that they're wearing these shirts, you know, with the one portion hanging there. <laughs> Match up shirts. Perfect in South America for a man. Anything to add? Something to add? Just tell me about this at what point. That's what I'm saying. That's what they say. And sometimes we start to talk about the concept of the concept of the concept of the concept of the And what things shouldn't we say?
choose? The heart chooses in relationship to the intelligence. When one is satisfied by the uh, philosophy which is spoken by the spiritual master, when one is satisfied by the activities that the spiritual master is doing or having done, and one's heart is a little touched because after all, one has to see Krishna through the spiritual master and see that this person is going to bring me to Krishna. And when he's satisfied in that way, then he knows. But one must be sincere. One must be sincere to actually wish to surrender, actually wish to have spiritual master, then Krishna will help. Krishna is also there. He will help. But therefore, this is only done, or should only be done, if there's such a question at all, it should only be done after minimum a six-month period of seeing, if there's a question at all. Most persons actually join the Krishna consciousness movement when they have some faith in the spiritual master. So for them, there's not much of a question. But in the case where there might be a question, then one should wait for some time until he gets, he gets what he's looking for. You look like you're cooking up a crisp. No? Yeah, you were. Why you come up with that? <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. 
<laughs> Never ask you to do anything at all. <laughs> and speak about Krishna and Lila, Lord Chaitanya, and this and that. Never really get down to the philosophy where you, nonsense rascal number one, you gotta surrender. You lusty fellow. <laughs> The way I speak, I'm amazed that anybody joins this room. <laughs> I do it all wrong. <laughs> I always criticize everybody. <clears throat> I'm always chastising like an angel. I always have my club out and beat you on the head if you're a lusty fool. <laughs> I may forgive you also if you do things wrong, but it may take a while. <laughs> and you might suffer in this <laughs> and I'm always engaging everybody in the preaching work and working harder than they can work. I do everything all wrong. And we just talk about the philosophy all the time. And every now and then, rarely, we talk about some higher point of Krishna, Lila, or something. Maybe somebody really. So we do everything all wrong. And yet, still, some like to submit. So that's good. <laughs> Spiritual master is not supposed to be a flatterer. You should never be in, in engaged in a situation where you should flatter others for making money or flatter others to do anything. Sometimes you may flatter everybody by saying you're all very great, exalted, elevated, wonderful souls. By the third word, everybody knows for sure this is a joke. <laughs> Are there any qualifications in the commercial F that I'm searching for? He must be sane. And if he's not sane, he must be at least dedicated to stay around and become sane. He must be actually willing to follow the regular principles. He must be actually willing to follow the whole morning program and be very eager to have our work in class and even the He must be very eager to perform activities which will be beneficial for his spiritual advancement. He must be eager to hear and to follow, basically. He has to have that sincerity. That's not just for newcomers. <laughs> That's for the old men, too. Jai.